History has not ended, predictions notwithstanding. There are always new challenges. There have just been three or four severe crises, and therefore Europe still faces new challenges to which it has to respond. At the turn of 2019, a new European Commission took office, with one particular portfolio the subject of a rather telling renaming. Under Ursula von der Leyen's leadership, the former Commission spokesperson and MEP Margarita Schinas from Greece was appointed Vice President for quote-unquote promoting the European way of life, with broad purview over such diverse policy areas as education, skills, asylum, healthcare and internal security. Bar the deluge of outrage at the time from progressives aghast at the chauvinistic undertones of such a job title, the presumption that the nearly 500 million citizens of the European Union would share a common quote-unquote way of life worth promoting should challenge the listeners of uncommon decency, premised as our podcast is on deciphering the political character of the old world. In a book forthcoming with Princeton University Press entitled Embattled Europe, Professor Conrad Jarausch of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill traces Europe's experiment with liberal democracy all the way back to the aftermath of World War I, when Woodrow Wilson came to preach a vision of a world order of self-determined national units stemming from the ashes of collapsed empires. Professor Jarausch proceeds to argue that Europe has since surpassed its former American lodestar, with its blend of proportional representation, cooperative foreign policy, and a generous welfare state, the EU has come closest, in his view, to fulfilling the progressive aspirations of societies on both sides of the Atlantic, with America increasingly poised to draw inspiration from Europe for the conduct of its own affairs. Similarly, in the primacy of politics, Professor Sherry Berman of Columbia's Barnard College describes European-style social democracy as the end-stage solution to the central challenge of modern politics, that of reconciling a free enterprise economy with the democratic part. So to begin with, Professors Jarausch and Berman, I'll begin with a straightforward question, beginning with Professor Jarausch and then turning over to Professor Berman. If the strengths of the European project are so self-evident, why does the bloc seem so embattled, to, to borrow from the book's uh, title? Thank you very much for your interest in my new book. The answer to your question is twofold or threefold. History has not ended, predictions notwithstanding. There are always new challenges. There have just been three or four severe crises. And therefore, Europe still faces new challenges to which it has to respond. Moreover, in the United States, and to a degree also in Great Britain, There is much hostile rhetoric that is trying to discredit an alternative to the American way of life, which could be called social democracy. Professor Berman. So I look, I think there's um, there's a lot of strengths that Europe has that Professor Jarush will discuss and I'm sure is discussed in his book. But there have been very significant challenges that Europe has faced in the last several decades. Over the course of the post-war period, that is to say after the Second World War, one of the challenges that had so bedeviled Europe and European democracy in particular, that of class conflict, had in fact, I think, been largely, not entirely, but largely solved by the post-war, what I think of as social democratic sentiment. But over the last few decades, a bunch of new challenges have arisen that I think Europe has not dealt with very well. One of those is economic. There are some real economic challenges that Europe faces. The second is a challenge that the United States has faced for a very long time. And while we've not done a great job of it, we at least have more experience with it. And that is the challenge of an increasingly diverse society. That is to say, how to reconcile diversity with democracy. And the third challenge, of course, is the expansion of the European Union. And by that expansion, I mean incorporating in the former communist countries, many of which have experienced significant democratic backsliding over the last 15 years. And that is a challenge for Europe because Europe is based on a liberal democratic foundation and having within Europe, therefore, countries that are neither liberal nor democratic 
is incredibly problematic. And the European Union itself, there is a real struggle within that union about what the future of that union should be, how closely connected should the countries be, what is the correct balance between nation states in Europe. These are all things I think that have really shaken European democracies over the last couple of decades. Mm -hmm. um, Professor Jarosch, one of the pillars of the European model, as you see it, describe it in your book, is for welfare states. Now, arguably, I think the EU is the socio-economically safest place to be born if we lived in a Rawlsian simulation, a Rawlsian veil of ignorance world. And yet, the kind of social transfers and the safety nets that exist in Europe also largely depend on a vibrant and dynamic economy. And on this score, I think it is fair to say that compared to America, there or even uh, Israel or, or the UK, there hasn't been as strong as a drive on innovation um, as in these countries, which such innovation allows for the states to finance their social model. Is there something Europe is doing wrong when it comes to economics? Or do we have to accept as Europeans, that our social model will always be the flip side of, um, or well, the positive side of a lack of maybe innovation. Professor Jarosch. Well, uh, several comments on this one. There is a neoliberal claim that I think is misleading that European economies underperform. It has to do with living standards, whether or not you look at individual income, or whether you look at quality of life, which has to do also with childcare and health insurance and, indi and uh, indications uh, like that. Yes, there is a good deal of excessive regulation in Europe that makes innovation more difficult, but there are also major competitors in Europe like Airbus, uh, which is doing just as well as Boeing, uh, which are doing fine. It's a question of individual uh, wealth and independence. That is a neoliberal kind of view on the life versus a one in which there is social responsibility. And for my money, that is, I think, a more constructive way to be, especially uh, the book was written also at the time in which Trump was president and in which there was a kind of uh, reactionary populism uh, in the United States and to a degree also in Great Britain. And therefore, one should not just take the critique of economic performance at face value. Mm -hmm. Professor Berman, you've written a lot about social democracy and neoliberalism. Do you think that the EU has set its balance between maybe those two poles right, or have we gone too far towards one side or the other? So that's a great question, actually, because one of the tensions I think that is bedeviling Europe right now is between the European Union and um, European nation states and the priorities that those different levels have set for themselves. Look, as the previous question to Professor Jerush pointed out, the welfare state is a critical part of what makes Europe Europe. And I think different kinds of welfare states have different kinds of um, growth promoting or growth inhibiting qualities. So, I mean, I'd like to come back to that. I think the welfare state shouldn't be treated as a homogenous thing. There are very different kinds of welfare states in Europe. The difference between the Swedish welfare state and the Spanish welfare state is incredibly important. And I think is an important component of why Sweden, for instance, is a more innovative economy than Spain. But to get back to the question that you posed to me in particular, look, Europe, for a variety of complicated reasons, has become a neoliberal promoting machine. Mm 
that is most clear and I think most unfortunately consequential in Eastern Europe, but it's also the case in Western Europe. That is to say a lot of the sort of regulations or priorities built into the recent European project have really promoted neoliberal reforms and trajectories across Europe. And to some degree, that is in tension with the welfare state priorities or the social democratic priorities that still exist in most European nation states. And so again, thinking about how the balance between those two things works out, that is to say the regional European level and the national level, I think is very important. Um, and why, for instance, parties of the left allowed, acquiesced, if so, and in some cases act, uh, um, actively promoted a neoliberal agenda at the regional level is a really important question. And I think one that does have significant bearing on the problems Europe as a whole is uh, facing today. That's a fantastic segue on a uh, follow-up question I wanted to ask. Um, social democratic parties aren't doing that great. There's been one exception in the recent history. It's been Portugal, and now there's another one in Germany with Olaf Scholz's relative success, but even that compared to where the SPD, the Social Democrats in Germany used to be, it is still a middling score. Um, why do you think the Social Democrats are so weak nowadays? Um, could it be a tension between a promise of social transformation, of social radicality, and membership in the European Union? I'm thinking there's one, I think, example which is very illustrative of this tension. It's back in 1983 when you've got a French socialist pres president, François Mitterrand, who has a very, very radical agenda, and at some point is stuck and has a decision to make. He can either decide to continue this with his um, election promises, or he can decide to abandon them because continuing his agenda would mean decoupling from the European monetary system. In the end, under pressure of Jacques Delors, Jacques Delors, who would end up being European commissioner, he ends up choosing um, Europe over the social radicality. Um, and ever since, the Socialist Party has been progressively dropping in election after election. Now, that might be a bit too simplistic an answer, but I think over Europe, there's been many examples of social democratic parties having to sacrifice that kind of radicality in the name of our EU membership. Professor Jarosch, do you think this is a fair assessment of the tensions between EU membership and um, social de democracy? Well, I would think that there's been a kind of informal division of labor that uh, the EU has pushed a neoliberal market agenda that even got Margaret Thatcher uh, to agree uh, with it in parts and has left the social um, welfare dimension to the national states. This has been unfortunate and it's also been partly a product of uh, British interference because as long as the UK was in the European Union, it steadfastly rejected all of efforts to come to a kind of social Europe, although the concept uh, has been rhetorically at least defended. My real answer would be that much of the social democratic agenda has already been achieved, and at least in Germany, the CDU under Merkel uh, tended to uh, steal the thunder of social democracy that is following social democratic policies uh, without being in that party. That would be one dimension. The other one is the difference of welfare states that Professor Berman talked about. And uh, it may be uh, important to point out that there is not just a transfer welfare state, but the Social Democrats tried to engage also an enabling welfare state and their clientele did not want to make that change. In the German context, it's the Agenda 2010 and it meant that uh, Gerhard Schröder lost the election because 
uh, the working class no longer felt protected. And the third dimension would be uh, the need to refocus on social inequality rather than on the U.S. diversity discussion that focuses on sexual preferences that are important on the campus level, but not for the population as a whole. Professor Berman? So I think that the, you know, sort of the way that you frame this starting off is, is and um, as Professor Jarush has followed up, is a good place to start. Look, you know, we have this Europe that ended up over the last several decades having these very strong, this very strong neoliberal bias built into it. And again, this is partially a consequence of things that social democratic parties acquiesced in or actively promoted. And to understand that, we need to go back to a really powerful ideational or ideological transformation that happens during this time, right? Which is to say that all parties, even parties of the center left kind of accepted after the economic problems of the late 70s and 1980s, this kind of neoliberal vision of capitalism. And at the time, you know, we can perhaps understand that what why that made sense. Europe was facing some significant economic problems. The collapse of communism at the end of the 80s, of course, brings around this kind of liberal triumphalism. And we get figures like Schroeder and Blair and others who really kind of move social democratic parties away from their sort of traditional profile and policies, which are protecting the underprivileged, constraining capitalism, you know, yada, yada, yada. And so what we got once that model began to show its obvious and inherent weaknesses were social democratic parties that really lacked a distinctive political profile. Voters became disengaged, volatility in Europe rose, voters began voting on the basis of short-term things rather than identities. And, you know, we got social democratic parties that had lost their traditional voter base and had voters that would have normally, or rather would have in the post-war period voted for them now, either leaving the voting cadre or voting for different parties. Most recently, of course, um, right-wing populist parties. So I think this kind of shift to neoliberalism at the end of the 20th century, which again, social democratic parties acquiesced in or actively promoted, really had the long-term effect of undermining the traditional profile of social democratic parties and robbing them of their traditional voting base. I think it's very hard to distangle these things. They really are part of a larger story of um, the dissolution of the post-war order that happens during the last part of the 20th century. Sure. Well, as Professor Jarosz uh, explains in, in his book, uh, Europe has become something of a dirty word for, for right-wing populists on both sides of the Atlantic. And you've both uh, addressed, uh, to some extent just now, the uh, right-wing populism in the continent. But uh, I think Professor Jarosz's book also um, also deals with uh, right-wing populism in America, which has uh, which has uh, found sort of a um, uh, a repoussoir in, in in the EU. And, and uh, Mitt Romney, uh, uh, I, I'm old enough to remember, was very adamant in 2012. He he lambasted Obama's record, Barack Obama's record, record for allegedly strive for bringing America closer in line with European style social democracy. And Donald Trump, uh, for his part has uh, routinely lampooned EU leaders for free riding on American defense and imposing all of these costly technological and environmental rules, such as through the, the Paris Climate Accord and, and things of that nature. So my question is, kind of setting this in a broader transatlantic uh, dimension, do you envision the U.S. electorate evolving uh, in the long term towards support of European-style social democracy in one form or another? Uh, Professor Jarosz. Yeah. First of all, there is a lot of confusion in the American public differentiating socialism slash communism on the one hand from social democracy. So uh, for electoral purposes, uh, the American right uh, still waves the communist flag in order to scare the electorate. Um, at the same time, there is a Native American progressive tradition uh, 
which is often overlooked, starting with Bob La Follette in Wisconsin, FDR, President Johnson, and so on. Uh, and so it is not just an electorate which is Trumpist and which is populist, but also which is potentially uh, reformist and left. Especially in the last election, I had a sense that the younger generation was looking for an alternative. Uh, Bernie Sanders' support you know, can be explained uh, by that. Uh, and then, of course, we have Biden elected and now the tensions within the Democratic Party between the Progressive Caucus and the more moderates. So we're, I'm not really talking about copying the European model in the United States, but rather finding an American equivalent based on American traditions, which would then be palatable to the American electorate. Professor Berman. Um, well, look, there's no doubt that sort of Donald Trump was the avatar of right wing populism. I mean, he was illiberal. Uh, I would say at this point, um, he'd revealed himself also to be clearly anti democratic. And, you know, like his European counterparts, he's feeding on a lot of discontent, a lot of dissatisfaction and a lot of concern on the part of hitherto dominant groups about their position in this new world. I mean, the causes of this kind of political movement, right-wing populism, really have to be seen again in the immense challenges that Western democracies have faced over the last couple of decades. And they really are quite immense, right? We have very, very clear changes in the nature of capitalism that have created a new, what a lot of social scientists refer to as a precariat rather than a working class. That is to say, people who are not only in traditional working class positions, but now face real um, insecurity, economic insecurity throughout their lives. New types of social divisions, rural urban divides are deeper than they had been during the post-war period. And on top of this is, as we discussed a little bit um, earlier, just incredibly changing demographics across Western societies. Many European societies now are as diverse as America, a long-standing home of immigration um, is. And this is really, these are challenges. And by the way, the United States also, even though it has a long history of immigration, um, had in the early years of the 21st century, a higher share of foreign born citizens really than at any other time, except, you know, with the close co close competition of the highest immigration periods in the early 20th century. So we have these social and demographic challenges, we have economic challenges, and of course we have immense technological change. And I think, again, these things have really fed into a sense on the part of many in Western societies that they don't really feel comfortable with, they don't really understand where the world is going. And that traditional establishment parties and politicians were not either able to or willing to respond to these challenges. And in these kinds of situations, you know, anti-establishment radical parties um, have flourished. And in the United States, sadly, that meant a Republican party that became a right-wing populist parties. And it also fed into growing support for right-wing populist parties in Western Europe and even more in Eastern Europe, where they now essentially control um, and have undermined liberal democracy in um, a few uh, East European countries. Yeah, there, there's always that that um, a combination of culture and economics that explains right the uh, the resentment that these parties are channeling on both sides of the Atlantic. And speaking of illiberal governments in in Central Europe and Central and Eastern Europe, one of the main challenges to uh, the supranational project in the EU has come from uh, this purported slide into a liberalism by some of these governments. You know, the question that is being asked is, you know, if, if, if Europe stands on values, why is it not able to enforce those values on, on governments uh, that are uh, allegedly backsliding in terms of rule of law, the independence of the judiciary and, and things of that nature? And, and progressive uh, critics uh, of this trend have found the EU lacking, that it lacks the tools to police rule of law in some of these countries that have allegedly embraced the values on which the EU stands and yet are uh, infringing uh, infringing upon uh, rule of law. So 
the question about populism here is you've got the populism of the far left, uh, which was a product largely in countries such as mine in Spain and Portugal and Greece, which is a product of the a response really to the hawkish uh, economic policies uh, that were implemented uh, during the sovereign debt crisis. And those those policies stoked the sort of the, the left wing resentment. Um, whilst in, in cu countries like Hungary and Poland, what we what we see now is right wing populism uh, that is, uh, you know, very critical of the in terms of migration and, and issues of that uh, sort. So. Um, what seems to hold true for insurgents from both camps is, is the resentment of uh, uh, elitist technocracy. And uh, my question, starting with uh, Professor Jarosz and then turning to Professor uh, Berman, is how, how safe is the EU from populist upsets of this sort from both the left and the, and the right wing? Well, I mean, certainly there is never any guarantee of future developments, and therefore populism like the... Uh, French Yellow Vest movement uh, came apparently out of nowhere uh, and then swept uh, a lot of uh, discontented electorate in front of it. The feeling of being left out uh, is real. It is not even so much material as it is psychological. In part, of course, this is a problem of communication of an elite integrationist ele uh, leadership with a broader electorate that is more concerned with its own daily uh, problem. It is also a question of European performance. Uh, Europe has to provide uh, an attractive lifestyle uh, for its model in order to prevail. So we're talking about a lot of challenges. But compared to the doom and gloom literature that was uh, around five years ago, uh, the European um, project has not foundered. Uh, it has proven surprisingly resilient. Yes, it is frustrating, annoying, uh, and so on, uh, that the decision-making process uh, is slow and reforms in majority voting would certainly help. So there are a lot of things that the, the EU needs to do, but I would still maintain that compared with the gerrymandering in the United States, the vote suppression uh, and many other things that are frustrating in this country right now, uh, that the European model has many things to offer so that Americans looking not just for an abstract ideological response, but rather for practical solutions can go and look at some of the core EU countries and will find examples uh, that if they were transferred, uh, they would help even in the United States. So I stand by my claim that the relationship has changed that in the post-war period in the 1950s, the United States was the great example of what Europeans wanted to become like, but that in the meantime, some of the European countries have emancipated themselves from this American tutelage and that the relationship has been reversed, that some of the solutions to the current problems which they offer uh, are so attractive that they would help the United States. The pandemic response is one uh, such dimension. Initially, the United States was better off, but in the meantime, European countries have overtaken the U.S. in vaccination. That's just one example. Sure. Uh, Professor Berman, how safe is the EU from, from populist uh, uh, upsets uh, from both the, the right and the left? Uh, so I would begin where Professor Jarush ended, which is that I think Europe is, um, to use uh, the title of his book, Embattled, but obviously has um, you know many strengths to build upon. I think there's simply no doubt that um, the rise of essentially illiberal, non-democratic regimes in Eastern Europe 
um, combined with the rise of uh, particularly right-wing populist parties in Western Europe has really, these two things have struck a very significant blow against the EU, both on the ideational and on the practical level. For Europe to include within its borders, countries that are effectively now no longer democratic, Hungary being the most clear example, but Poland, unfortunately, not far behind, is just simply an abomination. I mean, the European Union's origins lie in the project of protecting democracy in Europe after World War II. And so having within the European project countries that are no longer liberal or democratic has to be seen as really a very significant blow. And, and to a lesser degree, again, the rise of the kind of dissatisfaction with Europe that um, has partially fed right-wing populism in Western Europe. I think these are very significant challenges that, you know, Europe has been trying to grapple with, but will continue to have to grapple with and grapple with better, I would say, in the future. Nonetheless, nonetheless, Europe remains as a project. There is no outside of Britain, which has now decided to leave. Um, really significant call to leave in Western Europe. Even the right-wing populists that exist have sort of toned down their criticisms to the point where now they are saying we want changes in the European project rather than calling for leaving, most notably in places like France. Um, so look, I think that you know Europe is at a, you know, to overuse a term, social scientists love to invoke critical juncture, right? It has had significant blows struck against it, but it has really important strengths. I think people who spend their lives thinking about politics understand that Europe has to be part of the answer when we question why there has been no war in Europe, why Europe has been stable over the past decades. And if any, if you know anything about European history, you know this is an incredible accomplishment. And so continuing with this European project, right, but figuring out how to strengthen it against its enemies, figuring out how to make it once again a, a project that gives European citizens a concrete improvement in their lives on a regular basis, this is necessary going forward. It can't live off its laurels forever. And so I agree, you know, Europe remains something worth promoting and protecting, but in order to do so in the future, dealing with the specific challenges of today and figuring out how to improve Europe for the future is something that that's going to need to be done if things are to get better rather than stagnant. Yeah, the um, question is just how does one go about it? Uh, and uh, there's always a temptation from Brussels to use massive measures in order to get the illiberal regimes in Eastern Europe back in the line. The other, perhaps somewhat more successful uh, approach is to be patient uh, and to exert pressure and to help the democratic forces within these countries uh, in order to strengthen them. So I completely agree that the challenge of the EU is to live up to its own precepts, to its own ideals, uh, and that social democracy will need to play a major part uh, in this. But I also think that a lot has been accomplished already and that there is a kind of Euro bashing rhetoric in certain political circles uh, that diminishes the European accomplishment and does not understand what Professor Berman just explained so eloquently. So I, I want to go back on this kind of point of Euro, maybe not skepticism, but Euro cynicism, I think that um, Professor Berman laid out. Um, you gave, gave example of in, in France, and I think it's quite interesting to see that um, the surging right-wing candidate, Eric Zemmour, is very critical of the EU but says leaving it would be a disaster. So while he doesn't like it, he'd rather stay in it. Um, Matteo Salvini makes basically a similar case saying, uh, we're not fans of the EU, but you know, pragmatically let's stay in. But what all these things show is 
that there's a negative case for the EU that exists, not, not a positive case. And it seems to me that there is a lack of a new frontier for Europe, something it could seek to accomplish to give a positive case for EU membership. Uh, you talk, you touched on it, both of you here, mm-hmm. but um, what could that new frontier be? For example, could the um, common debt instrument that the uh, European leaders agreed on uh, last summer um, be one of these things? Could it be a um, more integrated um, uh, Eurozone budget, um, more fiscal transfers across different countries? What would be that social democratic new frontier for um, uh, European social democratic parties? Professor Berman? So I think that it might be worth um, injecting a teeny little bit of um, social science jargon here. So um, political scientists and others like to differentiate between what we call performance and intrinsic legitimacy. So performance legitimacy is the legitimacy a political regime or whatever gets from performing well. Its outputs are good, beneficial, yada, yada, yada. Intrinsic legitimacy is what a regime gets because people just believe in it regardless of its performance or its output. I think a lot of people like us, highly educated people, conscious of history, who spend a lot of time on politics, kind of see Europe and we believe in it because of this intrinsic legitimacy. We just believe it's good. And while we bemoan the fact that sometimes it doesn't perform well, right, we support it anyway. I think what we've recognized since the financial crisis is that for most European citizens, performance legitimacy is really the way they view Europe. Like, so up through the financial crisis, Europe was kind of there in the background, seen as kind of to some degree contributing to economic growth. There were subsidies, there was the free market, there was, you know, travel among countries that sort of made everybody's life a little bit easier, yada, yada, yada. And then we get the financial crisis, which is, partially blamed on neoliberalism, which is associated with the European project. And of course, the European response to the financial crisis is really quite atrocious. And from there, we begin to see a lot of the dissatisfaction sort of becoming much more politically salient. So the point of this kind of, you know, uh, you know, sort of divergence into this performance intrinsic legitimacy thing is, I think, look, for most citizens, Europe is something that is there and um, they will support it at this point in time in so far as it is seen as benefiting them and their countries. And I think what's happened is that, again, over the last decade or so, especially since the financial crisis, a lot of people have begun to question that Europe needs to find a way to help Europeans live better lives. This means better economic lives. This means dealing with common challenges like immigration, like the environment, like the threats from outside powers, perhaps Russia and China, and also finding a way to bring Eastern European countries again back into that liberal democratic fold. I think This performance legitimacy aspect is the way in which most citizens will evaluate Europe, at least for this generation, and figuring out how to, again, take those sort of social democratic principles of solidarity and of security and not making them threatening to nation states and making them contribute to a more vibrant Europe. Yes, this is the challenge that Europe faces. This is the way to sort of recapture, if not the act of support, then at least the acquiescence of European citizens in this project. And, you know, I hope um, for the sake of Europe that um, the folks who run the EU and care about the EU figure out how to do this again. Professor Jawash? Yeah, I think there are projects out there that would uh, re-energize Europe, what von der Leyen is trying to push in climate green deal, climate departure, leadership of Europe uh, in this area is one dimension. But I would come back and say that social inequality is another one. uh, And often it is forgotten by uh, the well-to-do elites that are in favor of Europe. So uh, 
the Brexit shock, I think, made it clear also that what is taken for granted on a daily level, like Schengen Europe, uh, the free travel and so on, is threatened if people are not uh, committed to uh, Europe and if the process of integration does not uh, continue. It is uh, a kind of difficult situation, rhetorically speaking, you have to convince people whose daily lives are not necessarily directly related uh, to Europe, but in the reverse consideration, what would be lost if it were no longer there, uh, then I think it becomes clear how important the achievements of Europe that have been made in the recent decades have become and what is needed is a continuation of this trajectory. Professor Berman wanted to, to follow up. So I think this point that Professor Jarush made is a really important one and kind of in some ways brings us full circle. Look, the the foundation of successful liberal democracy after the Second World War was this kind of social democratic compromise, right? A recognition after the tragedies of the interwar years and the Great Depression that, you know, capitalism and democracy were very much at odds if governments did not do something to change that dynamic. Things like dramatic inequalities within societies, a lack of social solidarity, these kinds of things are deadly for democracy. And the irony, of course, of the current, current period is that that social democratic insight has kind of a little bit been lost at the European level. I mean, countries that are the most social democratic, the frugal four, are the ones that are most opposed to more social transfers. And these are the countries that know best, in fact, that a house divided its, um, uh, among within itself, against itself, cannot stand. It's hard to imagine Europe being the strong force necessary for economic growth and for promoting peace with the kinds of divisions that exist within the Europe. Sure, that will require a lot of sacrifice. Sacrifice on the part of the wealthy, just like the domestic level welfare states did. But the question is, what is the alternative? The status quo in Europe right now strikes me as, as I mentioned before, over the long term, not entirely tenable. Sure, um, you know, it's very hard to convince taxpayers in the Netherlands or Sweden to send their money to states that they think are weak and inefficient, which they truly are, places like Greece and parts of Eastern Europe. But the question again, as it was after 1945, is what is the alternative. Deep social divisions within Europe, a lack of social solidarity over time, just as those corrode the foundations of democracy, they will corrode the foundations of Europe. And so figuring out again how to spread that social democratic insight, to give it practical manifestations that make things a positive rather than a zero-sum game, that is the challenge, I think, for Europe going forward. But it can't be just transfers. It also has to be help in increasing competitiveness. And I think if both things go together, then this is also politically sustainable. Thank you so much for, uh, for being with us. And, and um, again, we encourage folks to, to head over to uh, Princeton University Press and uh, and uh, get a copy of Professor Jarosh's book, which is uh, forthcoming in the week of November 2nd in Europe, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, thank you so much for listening uh, to another episode of Uncommon Decency. So, Jorge, Professor Berman and Professor Jarosh are out. What did you make about this conversation on Europe and social democracy? Sure. Well, um... You know, the, the, as you and I were, were just discussing off the record, uh, neoliberalism is, is always a, a, you know, a, a very hard term to define. And I think we could have pressed our, both of our guests to, uh, to, um, uh, to, uh, to define the term in, in with, with some clarity. I think usually the way that it's defined in sort of social sciences, uh, 
the idea that you've got market dynamics that are increasingly uh, find their way into the state and into the public uh, sphere. And that is the, that is the sort of the regime that we live in uh, that has uh, uh, emerged since the 1980s and and, and beyond is uh, is one of neoliberalism, whereby uh, the market isn't just constrained to its its own boundaries, but increasingly pervades spheres of life, such as the state uh, that used to be uh, hit her to um, uh, out of bounds. So um, I think that that would be that would be a sort of one, one possible definition of neoliberalism. But the thing that that uh, I wanted to to come in with is, um, you know, Europe. Europe has been, as Professor Berman said, a neoliberal project in some respects. I think that the, the European integration that has taken place after Maastricht has been uh, primarily, or perhaps slightly before that, in, in, since the single European Act since uh, 1986, uh, the, the kind of European integration that, is, that has uh, taken place is, you know, it's, it's been about uh, 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 decreasing barriers, uh, I mean, uh, lifting barriers to, to commerce within uh, the single market, uh, economic liberalization, uh, you know, integrating uh, the Eastern European states into the EU, which has uh, obviously created competition, labor competition, for instance, primarily between workers on uh, in Western Europe and Eastern Europe. Uh, so, so I think um, the the thing that really strikes me is is uh, Europe is neoliberal not only because of these reforms, but also because the political elites in the na in the national uh, in in national countries. Uh, have um, uh, essentially, uh, the, it, it's been politically expedient for them to blame uh, the EU for uh, the, the, the tough, the, the, the neoliberal reforms uh, that, that have taken place. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure to rephrase some of this when I'm, so um, go ahead. So I agree with you that it has been always a political trick in the bag to say, well, it's not my fault, it's the EU. Even, even within kind of more centrist parties, there's a tendency to kind of say, well, it's not my fault, it's the EU. But while this is true, it is also true that for political leadership that decided to give that much power to the EU did so willingly and in some ways accepted to tie its hands to European policy in a way that wouldn't allow that political class to do a 180 turn later on. In the case of Italy, it's quite actually quite explicit. The Italian political leadership knew that if it wanted some discipline, especially some budgetary fiscal discipline, the EU would be an amazing tool. So the Italians decided willingly to tie their hands to something. It's like um, Odysseus, um, when he wanted to hear the song of the sirens, but knew he would be strong enough, so he decided to tie himself, um, um, tie himself to, to the mast of his ship. I think in many ways, the European political leadership has decided to tie itself to the European mast and, and, and possibly in very positive ways. Um, but it's also um, when people say, well, you know, the politicians are blaming the EU uh, all the time. It is true, but it's also true that they decided willingly to tie mm. their hands to, um, uh, mm. to EU policy. Yeah, absolutely. And this this really goes to... It speaks to the the remark by Professor Berman that social democratic parties uh, from the from the mid from the eighties onwards have uh, acquiesced to the neoliberal uh, tenets of of European policy. They haven't uh, challenged uh, uh, they they haven't really challenged them. And your your example of Mitterrand, I think, is very telling. And it's one of the it's one of the cases of uh, European social democrats caving to uh, the neoliberal. Uh, Doxa. Uh, I think you've got other examples, Tony Blair and and uh, Gerhard Schröder, um, but but certainly uh, you know after the 1980s you don't see a uh, resistance any any longer to uh, to neoliberalism on the centre left. Um, on on the point you're making about the left and um, neoliberalism or, or European neoliberalism, um, first of all, I always find it quite interesting to see how the left had the kind of ideological justifications for um, neoliberalism because you know, obviously neoliberalism, they didn't call that, they had a different kind of, um, it didn't have that name, you know, we didn't have this con notion, this concept before, but there was an idea that 
the left has always been very strong, which is, you know, internationalism. And I think the justification on the left for neoliberal politics, whether we agree or not with the kind of term of neoliberalism, existed thanks to this commitment, this left-wing commitment to internationalism, which made the pill, the neoliberal pill, a lot easier to swallow intellectually. And I think it's very clear in the case of, you know, third way left and with Tony Blair and um, his advisor, Tony, Tony Giddens, um, there was a kind of strong intellectual justification to it, um, whereas the right will make a kind of more pragmatic case for, for, for um, neoliberalism. The left ended up going through that um, process through a ideological uh, lens. Well, thanks to Professor Berman and Professor Jarosch for this conversation on Europe and social democracy. Um, now to you, our listeners, don't forget, if you want to support the show, you can do all the basics, the very useful basics, such as sharing the show, subscribing, liking, reviewing, all these small things really help the show grow. But, but, but if you want to go that little mile further, we now have a Patreon page. Um, um, it is, should be down below in the blurb. Um, we really don't expect much. Um, it's mainly to cover, you know, some of the small costs we have um, for the microphones, for the distribution stuff, for the recording uh, website we use, all that kind of small stuff. So if you want to help us uh, with all these things, we've got a Patreon page, and we'd be very happy to have your support. Now, anyways, thank you very much for listening. And